You're talking about Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, Scottie Pippen just got beat by college kids? Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1. And uh, while you find that, I want to tell you a little story that some of you might remember. I actually remember this happening when I was a child. It was in 1992. Now, first of all, I don't fully understand how some of these things happen because I was, for y'all who don't know, I was going to go to the Olympics when I was 16. Like, that was, that was a plan in my life. If you'd asked me at 13, 14 years old where I was going, I would have told you at 16 I was going to the Olympics. I had an Olympic coach. I was a gymnast. I was going to the Olympics. I was fully under the impression that you could not be paid and then go to the Olympics. And I remember having a, a, a struggle with this. Like, you couldn't be a professional athlete and then go to the Olympics. That wasn't allowed. That was like a rule. I don't, I'm not a, I don't know much more than just that, but I, I remember that being a rule. But in 1992, I remember this happening, and this is why it stuck in my mind. Because for some reason, America was allowed in the Olympic, Summer Olympic team to put the dream team together. Anybody remember this? And so you had Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson on one team. And everybody thought this is going to be the unstoppable team. I mean, you have, we have a name for Michael Jordan right now. If you get online and look, people call Michael Jordan GOAT, greatest of all time. Like he, he was a good basketball player. You can't take that away from him. And the same, I mean, Larry Bird and Scottie Pippen, you're talking, they really were the dream team. And do you remember, does anybody remember this besides me? There was a scrimmage. The coach decided, the coach of the, of the Olympic team decided that he was going to host a publicity stunt. It was just supposed to add some publicity, and, and they did it as a charity event, and they were going to scrimmage. The dream team was going to scrimmage a college team. And so they put all the college stars together and made the college dream team, and then they had the dream team with all the guys that I just named for you. And after the end of a 20-minute scrimmage, the college team beat the dream team. If I remember correctly, it was either by 10 or 12 points. And everybody was in this huge uproar. I mean, the, you're talking about Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, Scottie Pippen just got beat by college kids? And everybody was making excuses. The coach, the moment the scrimmage was over, he had the board erased. He said, erase it, get it off the board, get off the scoreboard so they don't get so many pictures of it. And the press was running in. They wanted to talk to the players and... They were all making excuses and saying different things. It was Michael Jordan who they went to. You could look this up on YouTube. Michael Jordan, they went to him in an interview, and, and I'm not going to get this verbatim. I didn't write it down. It didn't matter that much. But Michael Jordan had this to say to the interviewer. He said, well, it proves something. You put some basketball, a star-studded basketball team together, and if we don't know how to play together, we still lose. At the end of the day, we're all real good basketball players, but when you put us together, we didn't play well together. And the reason we didn't, we didn't win is because we didn't play well together. I might be a good player, and Larry Bird might be a good player, but they can't beat an entire team by themselves. We, we have to do this together. Uh, like I said, that's not verbatim, but that's, that's the essence of what he said. We didn't play well together, and that's the reason that we lost. Today, I want to talk to you about our church. And in 2020... I want us to really focus on doing ministry together. If, if you really want to see a ministry thrive, we need to make sure that we're doing ministry the right way, which is God's way, and we need to be doing that together. Now, I will warn you that this sermon could have been like four hours long. I went through and swiped out all, I had like 12 things. I've got it down to six I do not plan to hold you here for two hours, but I would ask you to indulge me and stick with me because I think that, that if you will, I think we'll learn something from this. And I really think the Lord has something for us this morning. So I hope I gave you plenty of time to find it. It's Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. Do you have it? Amen. Look at this. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave power. He gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases. And now the name of the twelve apostles are these. First Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, the brother, uh, and Andrew his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, Labius, whose surname was Thaddeus, 
Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and see what he has for us. Heavenly Father, we turn to you first and foremost. And first of all, Lord, can I just say thank you that you would incline your ear to us not once in the morning, but multiple times as we pray and come to you that you would open your throne room to us. Father, you are too good to us, and we don't even recognize all the mercies that you have for us. So thank you. Thank you for communion today. Thank you for uh, those who would come and sing and help in service. And Father, thank you that we get to be right here right now to hear your word. And Lord, we want to hear from you, and so we pray that we would. Father, we want to hear from your spirit. We want to be drawn unto you. We want our relationship with you to go deeper. And we pray that you would help us to do that. And so, Lord, I pray right now that you would just speak in this place. Speak through your word. Let your word come alive to our eyes and to our ears and to our hearts. And most of all, Lord, to our lives. And may we be impacted by what we hear today, so much so that we apply it. That we apply it to our lives and we don't leave here the same as we came in, but, Father, that we leave excited and changed for you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, check this out. Look, this is one of the times that God gives us in his word a straight list of his disciples, of all the disciples' names. And before he does that, look in verse, 10, in verse 1 of chapter 10. He says, And when he had called his twelve disciples to him. Now, I want to ask you a question before I get started in, straight into the text, which is this. Was it always just 12 people with Jesus? Did he, always just, did he have just 12 people who followed him the whole time? Turn in your Bibles with me real quick. It's, just, it's real close. You're in Matthew 10. Go backward a little bit to Matthew 4. Look back at Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23. Look at Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23, and I'll read through 25. Matthew 4, verses 23 to 25. Do you have it? Look at this. And Jesus went about Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases among the people. And then his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments and those who were demon possessed and epileptic and paralytic. And he healed them. And verse 25, you ready? Great multitudes followed him from Galilee to Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea and beyond the Jordan. Did you get it? At one point, Jesus has great multitudes of people following him. And Jesus chooses out of that great multitude, 12. Just 12. It's interesting to me to think that God's chosen people in the Old Testament, there were 12 tribes of Israel. I'm not going to sit here and try to make something of numbers of biblical numbers, I'm simply saying to you, did you notice that of all the nations of the world which were all gods, you realize the Jews weren't God's people because they were Jewish, they were God's people because he, he called them, right? He, it was his choice. He chose them, and what did he choose out of them? He chose the 12 tribes of Israel, all the nations of the world, and he chooses 12 sons to make tribes, to make his great nation. And out of a great multitude of people in the New Testament, what does God choose? 12 people. Where did the multitudes go? Anybody remember the story? How do we go from multitudes and then at one point we get right back down to just the 12? Do you remember how that went? It actually happened with like what we did today with the Lord's Supper. The Lord's having his, he, before he's going to have his supper, he, he's got this great multitude of people following him. And do you remember what Jesus said? He told them, he said, look, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you're not going to be any part of me. You're not my disciples if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood. And do you remember that the people left? And it was back down to the 12 disciples again. I want you to really listen to me. Listen. When we choose to follow the Lord, nobody promised you that the things he teaches you are going to be easy to accept, easy to understand, Sometimes even easy to believe. Most of what we read in the Bible is very challenging. It challenges your personal life. Do you remember what happened when the guy came to Jesus and he was like, I want to follow you, but my, my dad's dying. Do you remember? What would we do today? In our day, you ready for me to get real serious? In our day of slip your hand up. Ooh, I know. That's mean. Right? In our day, we have an altar call and what do we say? Let's, 
If you're, if you're too scared to walk forward, just, just, just slip your hand up. I was in, a, I was in a, a youth rally at a Christian school in Shelbyville this past year, and, and this guy, I had the sermon, and then when I got done with the sermon, he comes up, hits me on the shoulder, and he goes, I'll, I'll get the altar call, whispered it in my ear. And then he's got all these kids in a Christian school, and he says, if you've made a decision for the Lord today, I, I'm not going to ask you to do much. Just, just slip a hand up. And then he's standing at the stage and he goes, I, I see that hand. I see that hand. All right, are you ready for me to get real serious? The Lord didn't ask you to slip a hand up. He asked you to give your whole life to him. Come on in, join us for worship. He said, give your whole life to him. Remember, the guy comes to Jesus and he said to Jesus, he said, I, I was going to follow. He said, I was going to follow, but my dad's dying. And what, what did Jesus say? In our day, what would he say? It's okay. You, come another time. Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead. If you're going to follow, come follow. Are you ready for this? I'm going to get real straightforward. If you're going to follow the Lord and his church... Come follow. It's time to get serious. So, uh, now listen, some of you, some of you who are, are inundated with things here in church and you're, you're participating and you're serving, you're already in it. Please do not take this as, as me slighting you. I'm not. But there are some of you and you know exactly who you are. Who you do a really good job of warming up the pew for everybody. I know, I got serious. The Lord, listen, you want to join a church where you get perks and privileges and you get, and if you want to join a church so that you can have a vote at the business meeting, if you want to join a church so you get to say what color the walls in the Sunday school class should be, if you want to join a church so that you think that I'll have to marry you at your, at your wedding, which by the way, I have a lot of stipulations about that and people find it's a little harder to get me to do that than they might realize. It's true. Hey, listen, if you want to join the church so that you can get perks and privileges, there's plenty of other churches down the road. We join because we want to serve the Lord together. Amen. We want to go out into his world and spread his kingdom and his gospel. And that might happen in different ways. Some people in mission trips and some people in ministries, some in the church and some getting out of the church. But listen, if you're coming to church and you're not participating, what are you doing? What are, what are you doing? The Lord says, don't forsake the gathering of yourselves together as is the manner of some. And he does not just mean coming to worship. We're supposed to be serving together. Jesus called 12. You might look at me and say, well, Justin, well, what do we have? We only have 50 people. The Lord only had 12. What's the big deal about a number? He took the 12, he called the 12, and he called them for a reason. Check this out. Look, he, when he had called, I'm in verse 1 of chapter 10, so Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. When he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out. And we'll read the rest of that in a moment. Second thing I want to point out to you, number one was this. The number didn't mean anything. Number two, did you notice he's the one that called them? Here is a team of people, this 12 guys... There's fishermen, tax collectors, there's political zealots. And Jesus calls this team of 12 guys together. He didn't wait for them to come to him. He called them. Look, I want to, I want to read this to you. It comes out of John 15, 16. You can turn if you want, but I'm going to read pretty fast because I don't want to linger too long. John 15, 16 says this. You did not choose me. But I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your faith should remain and that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Jesus said, I didn't, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And did you see it in, in John 15, 16, what he said? I chose you to do something. I chose you to bear fruit fruit. Are you ready for this? God called these 12 unlikely guys together. Excuse me, I'm going to have to wipe my nose. God calls these 12 unlikely guys together 
so that they can bear fruit. Have you ever considered the fact that God called you right here? Now, some of you are going to go, no, wait a minute, there's a story behind that. No, my wife, my kids, my grandson, I saw an ad. That's just you denying what's really happening there. The Lord called each and every one of us here. And are you ready for this? To bear fruit. He did not call you here to do nothing. He did not call you here to get spiritually fat. I know. I said fat and it upset some people. It's okay. I said spiritually fat and that's right. Spiritual obesity. That's where you sit and eat and eat and eat all the time, but you never go out and do anything with it. How, right, I know it's hard in here today. How many people come and they hear the word and they love to hear the word, but then they do nothing with the word? Jesus did not call you to do nothing. He called you, very specifically, he called you here to bear fruit. My parents have this, uh, they have this orange tree, goofballs. They went to Georgia or something and they were at a fruit stand and they were buying some fruit and there were these little stubs of, you know, trees that you could buy. And so my dad buys an orange tree, brought it here to Kentucky. <laughs> I said, Dad, what are you going to do with that orange tree? He goes, I'm going to put it in a pot. Okay, <laughs> go for it. So my dad puts his orange tree in a pot. Two years goes by, and he's talking to a lady who's real good with plants that we worked with, and he said, Susan, why, why don't I have any oranges on my tree? First of all, it's not even a tree. It's like a bush it's in his room. She said, you don't have a, any oranges on the tree because it probably doesn't get any light. So my dad thought he would do something real wise. He went and got one of those lights that you put over the plant. And so he's got this UV light. And now he's got all of these little scrawny, like, if you ever see the little cutie oranges, it's like a quarter of the size of a cutie orange. And they're like pale yellow and they're gross looking. And he's all excited. His tree's got this fruit on it. And I'm like, Dad, nobody's ever going to want to eat those, those oranges. They look, I, I think they might make you sick. Like, I don't know if, they're, if you're putting radiation on them with that light or what you're doing. But he's got this little bush of a tree with all these little nubs of oranges on it. And that's not for two, the next two years, he had it for four years now. The next two years, he gets all these little tiny quarter-sized oranges all over his tree, and then that's all he can get. Why won't his tree bear fruit? Because it's in the wrong place. You don't, you don't put an orange tree in Kentucky. The orange tree won't bear fruit. There's nothing wrong with the orange tree. You put the orange tree in the wrong place. You get what I'm saying? Why are you here? Why did God bring you to a little tiny church in Oldham County to bear fruit? You put the wrong tree in the wrong place, it won't bear any fruit. You put the right tree in the right, in the right place, and it'll bear fruit. This is why I try to explain to our church people, I try to explain to you in the, in the congregation and when we have lessons, that we are not against other churches. Why is Ballardsville a mile down the road from us? You want to know why? Because the Lord has people that need to be planted there to bear fruit. Why is LaGrange Baptist and LaGrange... Uh, uh, Southeast Christian LaGrange campus. Why is it just three or four miles down the road from us? Because the Lord has those places so that he can plant trees there and they can bear fruit. Why did God bring you here? Because he needs you to bear fruit here. He didn't call you here to do nothing. He called you here to bear fruit. And he called this, this team of 12 people together. He said, I didn't, you, didn't, you, didn't, you didn't come to me. I called you. And why did I call you? To bear fruit. That's always been the theme of what Jesus has told us, that he's called us to bear fruit. Number three, third thing, look at this. And when he had called them, he had called his 12 disciples to him. He gave them power over, ooh, this is going to get good, unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases. Are you ready for this? You need to be ready for this. If you don't, if you don't think you need to be, you need to put this in your armory. First of all, we need to dispel something. You need to know that cults love to use this as a way to get you to doubt your faith. Did you catch what I said? Cults use this very verse to get you to doubt your faith. And they'll say things like this. They'll say, oh, so, so you think that you're saved or you believe in, the, you believe in Jesus. You think that, that makes for your salvation. Well, Jesus said that you should cast out demons. He, he said that you, should, that you should cast out unclean spirits and that you should heal people. Does your church do that? Do you heal people? 
Do you cast out unclean spirits? Everybody pay attention. Listen, real close. When we study the scriptures, we look at the context. Anyone who ever brings to you and says, you need to be, look, you need to be casting out unclean spirits and you need to be healing people. And if you can't do that, then it's, that's, you don't have any evidence of your faith. I want you to take them just a few verses further. Look at verse 5. We're not going to preach verse 5, but just look at verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out, commanded them, saying, Do not go the way of the Gentiles, and do not go to the city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost house of the sheep of Israel. Okay, if you want to tell me that we should be casting out demons, then I would like to tell you that you've done wrong by coming to me because I'm not a Jew, and you should only be going to Jews. Catch what I just said there? I'll do it again. If you come and talk to me and you try to proselytize me into your cult, You've done wrong because the very verse that you say I should cast out demons, you missed it. Because the very same verses say that you should also only go to the lost house of Israel. The context is not for you. That context is not for you to apply to yourself and say, oh, I'm supposed to be casting out demons. I'm supposed to be healing people. No, Jesus gave that to his disciples in that day so that they would fulfill prophecy and so that the Jews would believe. Understand? That's the context of that. But what can we learn from it? Did you catch this? Look, read it again. Verse t chapter 10, verse 1. And he called his 12 disciples to him. He gave them power. A tax collector. A tax collector gets power to cast out unclean spirits? A fisherman? He gives a fisherman power. To take people who are paralytic and raise them up. You ready for this? It's not my line, but it's a good one. If God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. What, remember, stick with me. Where'd we start? You need to be serving. The Lord called you here, and he called you here to bear fruit. And are you ready for this? Sometimes... He calls you to do something that you're very uncomfortable with. I am all for, I am all for taking whatever you do and serving the Lord with it. But if the Lord is calling you to do something, you can't stand back and say, oh, wait a minute, I can't do that. I'm going to tell you all a big secret. You ready for this? Do you know that when I planted the church, I had no clue how to plant a church? I told that to people. I remember they'd say, you didn't have any classes in school? No, that's the last thing they taught. You know what they taught me in school? They taught me how to read real good and how to write real fast. That was the, the one in seminary, he knows. They taught me how to read real good and write real fast. They taught me how to study. There's nothing. I'm telling you this. Eight years later, I can tell you for sure there is no book that could have ever prepared me to plant a church. I was telling somebody today about a guy that got mad at me one time in a service because I'd knocked on aliens and he got all mad at me. He came to me after service and railed on me because, I, because I'd made fun of people believing in aliens and a, some stupid television show. I'm telling you, I've had, I've had people, even again this morning, I was talking to somebody about, somebody came in the worship service one time and they like showed up and then they wanted to come up on the stage and sing. You, how, how can a book get you ready for that? Listen, this is real life ministry and you want to know something? I was the most underqualified person to ever do it. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you something else. This might be real shocking to you and you may not like it, but I want you to hang on to it. I'm probably, the not, I'm probably not the most qualified guy in the room to be up here. I'm just the guy that said yes. If the Lord calls you to do something, you do what he calls you to do. Remember Moses? He called Moses to, to free the people of Israel. They were, they were in slavery in Egypt, and what did Moses say? He said, oh, wait, wait, I can't. I, I'm slow of speech. Did God still use him? Sure he did. You don't get to step out of this and say, oh, I don't, wait a minute, Pastor, I, I'm not okay with that. I, I, listen, let me, let me come back to where I was. You get this? I know if you're, if you're good at something, if you're good at computers and serve the Lord with computers, if you're good at cars, serve the Lord with cars. But I'm telling you this, take that a step further. When the Lord calls you who's good with cars to go out and evangelize and you say, wait a minute, I'm not good with talking to people. It doesn't matter if he called you, you go. He doesn't, qual he doesn't call the qualified. He doesn't wait for you. He didn't wait for me. to. I didn't have a law degree. How was I supposed to write bylaws? But the Lord called me here and so I did. 
He called me. You want to know what's strange? Try to write a budget when you're guessing how many people might be coming to a new church a year from now. I'm not an accountant, but he called me here. And so I did what he asked me to do. Listen to what I'm trying to tell you. He calls these 12 together and he took a fisherman and said, I'm going to make you so that you can heal people. I'm going to give you power to heal people. He's a fisherman. He's not qualified to heal people. Jesus gave him the power. He's a tax collector. He's not. How's a tax collector? No, he should have got a rabbi, right? A scribe, somebody who knows the scriptures. No, he took the tax collector and he said, I'm going to have you cast out demons. Are you ready for this? When he takes you exactly where you are, whatever your job is, some nurse technician, x-ray technician, whether you work with computers, whether you work on cars, whether you work with kids, whether you work in the school system, whether you work with your hands and do construction, it doesn't matter whatever you do. If the Lord calls you to something else, you do it and he will qualify you. And he'll do more work with you than he will with, it, with any people that are, are, are theologians and know all about the scriptures. I got another one for you. Look at, start to get into these names. Look at this. Get verse 2. So I'm in Matthew 10 and verse 2. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. First Simon, who's called Peter. And Andrew, his brother. James. The son of Zebedee and John, his brother, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Labius, whose surname was Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Notice in that name, I'm sure there's some pretty famous names. I'm sure if you thought about Simon Peter for a moment, you could probably come up with some stories in your mind about Simon Peter. You've probably heard them. I'm willing to bet if you thought about Andrew for a moment, you could probably, come, you could probably think about some of the things that Andrew's done. Talk about John. I mean, he wrote four of the books in the New Testament. I bet you could come up with, with some knowledge about John. But then there's Bartholomew. You know anything about Bartholomew? He's good, because I don't either. <laughs> he was part of the Twelve. That's about as much as I can tell you. How about Thaddeus? You know anything about Thaddeus? Probably not. Not a whole lot that the Bible says about Thaddeus. I'll give you even a better one. How about James? You say, oh, I know James. He's got a book of the Bible. Not that James. As a matter of fact, James, you hardly know anything about James other than the fact that he's part of the 12. And as part of the 12, he was inside of Jesus' inner three that he would always have with him. James was even there at the transfiguration. But you don't know anything else about James. If you hear me, I just want to make another point to you. I want you to really hear this. When the Lord calls you to whatever he's calling you to, it's not always in the forefront. You don't always have to be in a prominent position to be doing what God called you to do. The role that he called you to do, he called you to do it. And if you do it, you bear fruit. That's the point. The point is not to be in the forefront and get everyone to, to notice you and to see you. Much of what happens happens in the background and happens with no one seeing it. Turn in your Bibles real quick. I know I'm running out of time, but turn in your Bibles real quick. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 15. If the foot should say, because I am not the hand, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? If the ear should say, because I'm not, of the eye, I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they are all one member, where would the body be? God has called each of us to a role, to serve in the role that he's called you to. If it's not in the forefront, that's okay. That doesn't mean it's not a role, and that doesn't mean it's not important, and it doesn't mean that you're not part of the body. It means that you're serving where God's called you to serve. Now, I got another one. I got to do two more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do them real quick. I know. I checked my watch. I shouldn't have done that because now I feel rushed, and you don't want me to quit. So, or maybe you do. <laughs> but number five, I want to give you a fifth one. You see Simon Peter. And when you think about Simon Peter, there's some, wonderful th there's some wonderful stories about Simon Peter. But you know what else we see out of Simon Peter? That dude messed up a lot. Do you remember with me, do you remember that Simon Peter, that Simon Peter was the one who Jesus was asking his disciples, he said, who do you say that I am? And they said, well, some people say you're this and some people say you're that. And Simon Peter 
Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood has not delivered this unto you. Remember that? You know what happens in the very next chapter? Peter's getting on Jesus about trying to go to Jerusalem. And you remember what Jesus said to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. The same Peter who said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Standing there watching Jesus transfigured into his heavenly state. And Peter, like a fool, said, let's build three temples. We'll build one to Moses and one to Elijah. And before he could get it out, God says, this is my beloved son. In essence, he said, Peter, shut up. Stop. It reminds me of something I want everybody to hear this. If we're going to get along in ministry together for the next year, we need to recognize something. We are all sinners. What about after we believe? We're sinners and we mess up and we make mistakes. And God didn't call you to point out everybody's mistakes. And if your goal, if, if you're going to get so mad that you find somebody's mistake, that somebody's a sinner, and it always happens this way. I know that people are sinners, but they shouldn't do that. Like my finger, because that one. <laughs> they shouldn't do that one. If you're going to get mad and leave because you find out somebody's a sinner, let me escort you to some other church, because there is no church that has perfect we're all messed up sinners. Do you know what the Bible actually says we should do with people who are sinners? We should try to restore them. We should try to bring them back in the fold. How much better would it be if your church family, when you messed up, if your church family rallied behind you and said, no, we don't want you to leave, but we don't want you to do that. And we want to we pick you up and say, no, 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 not on this hill. You're not dying here today. We're all messed up people. And I want to give you one more. Not only are we all messed up people, Thomas was messed up too. Thomas is in our list. He's going to be my last one. Thomas messed up. Remember Thomas? Jesus, out of everything that he saw, Thomas said, I'm not going to believe that he's raised from the dead unless I put my hands into the prince in his, in his hands and in his feet. We all remember that about Thomas. You know what we all forget about Thomas though? When Jesus was talking about going to see Lazarus, then it would go to Jerusalem would be very dangerous that Jesus would probably be killed. Jesus was going to go see his friend who had died, Lazarus. He's going to raise him from the dead. And all the disciples were saying, wait, no, stop, don't go. And you know what Thomas stepped up and said? It's out of, a, I'll just read it real quick. It's out of Luke chapter 5. Excuse me, I'm sorry, John chapter 11 and verse 16. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Did you catch that? The same guy who doubted Jesus is also the same guy that stood up to all the other 11 guys saying, hey, let's not go to Jerusalem. And Thomas stood up and said, let's go, even if that means to our own peril. I'll go die with him. I want to give you one more thing. I'm leaving you with this one. This is my sixth one. Not only should we not be worried about other people's sin, but I want to challenge you in 2020 to look for the good in your, in your fellow believers. Yeah, there's a whole lot of bad. If you want to come put a microscope on my life, there's a whole lot of bad. If you want to put a microscope on someone else's life, you're going to find bad. Get you a notebook. You could, you could fill the whole thing up. But I'd like to challenge you instead to do something different and look for the good that's in your brothers and sisters that are around you. The Lord put you here and he put you here with the people that are around you. He put you here to serve with them. So I don't know where you are today. I'm closing right now with this. I don't know where you are today. I don't know if you need to take a first step in salvation. Have you ever believed? I don't know. Do you need to take a step in salvation? Here's a good one for you. I didn't even get to this one. It was one of my points I was going to get to, but I didn't get to get there. It's okay, though. Maybe you need to be baptized. You know we have a church now with a baptistry in the church. We didn't have that before. We used to have to put up a pool. You think I'm kidding. We have the baptistry right here. If the Lord's calling you to be baptized, you need to do that. If the Lord's calling you to join and to serve, you need to do that. And even more, I'm going to leave you with this last one. If you're a believer and the Lord's calling you to do something, why don't you do it with your church family? It's time in 2020, it's time that we work together in the ministry to accomplish the goal that God has for us. We're not isolated in this. Ann's not isolated as, a, as the only missionary in the church. Tom's not isolated as the only deacon that we can ever have. You think it's all on me as the pastor? No, 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 no. Friends, we're going to do ministry together. And even if there's only 12, the Lord will change the world.